So we read before the prayer in Matthew chapter 12. I want to go back quickly and just revisit this. I want to continue talking about dry places. And this series and the title came from this verse here in Matthew 12, 43, where Jesus said, when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through where? Dry places. So obviously, you know, that's a vulnerable place. And I'm gonna begin to show you an example of that here, here in a moment where the enemy walks through dry places seeking rest and finds none. When you study the word and you see uh, uh, wilderness experiences in scripture, when you see the desert experiences in scripture, when you see the, 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 the 40 days and nights of Jesus in the wilderness in prayer and in fasting, these are wilderness dry place experiences that I feel like all of us can relate to in this world we're living in right now. And when I say world, the word world is not referring to a place It's as much it is, as it is a time, a time or a system. And we're living right now in a very peculiar world. The world is changing. The world is, is, is so peculiar right now with all that we're facing. Most of us are facing things that we've never faced or would have imagined to face in our lifetime. And you might look at that as a dry place, that, that man, things are hard, things are abrasive. People have gotten abrasive and mean-spirited and devices, divisive and just downright ugly. There's no doubt the world right now is a dry place, but we are not supposed to go just tuck our tail and hide until all this passes. No, God has called us for such a time as this. The world is in need of the water of life that Jesus gives, the water of life that the word of God gives, and this world may leave you thirsty, but Jesus is the answer. Can you say amen? amen? So Jesus talks about the dry place, the place of vulnerability, and how that when the enemy is gone out of, of a man, when uncleanliness or, 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 or an evil is gone out of a man, he, he walks through dry places seeking rest, and his only uh, uh, course is verse 44 to re enter the man that he came out because the individual that he came out of left his house, left his life vacant. I want you to go with me a few chapters back to Matthew 4. Matthew 4, and I want to look at Jesus in his dry place. If you're going to learn from anybody on how to respond to a dry place, it is Jesus. And so Jesus in Matthew chapter 4 is in a dry place, he's in the wilderness. How does he respond to a dry place? And there's something that Jesus does here that I really want to highlight and make sure that, that we understand. There are many people that have found victory, victory in mindsets, victory in worldview, victory over habits, serious life changes that have been wrought by the power of the gospel and by the power of Jesus and his word that in a dry place revert back to what they were once delivered from. Now, hopefully it's not you, but you probably know somebody that you saw victory come to their life, but they went back to the thing that God had once brought them out of. Being in ministry all my adult life, I can't tell you how many times, sadly, I've seen someone be delivered from addiction, be delivered from a certain lifestyle that was destructive, be made free, be made whole, be saved, and then go back to the life that they were once made free of. It fulfills the proverb that says, like a dog returns to its own vomit, many will turn back to the life that God once delivered them from. The point that Jesus is making in Matthew chapter 12 and verses 43 and 44 is that it doesn't matter if uncleanliness or if the enemy leaves your life until you feel that vacancy with the Lord, until you feel that vacancy with his spirit and with his word, you are left vulnerable to whatever it is that the enemy wants to do. So we have to make a, a, a decision that whatever is not of God as it is uh, uh, it, it, you know, expelled from my life, 
I'm not gonna just let my mind stay empty. I'm not gonna let my life stay empty. I've gotta fill my life with the word of God. The point is, is you can't get fear out of your life until you fill your life with faith. And you can't get hate out of your life until you fill your life with love. And you can't get, you know, confusion out of your life until you fill your life with understanding. And you can't get ignorance out of your life until you fill your life with knowledge. And you can't get foolishness out of your life until you fill your life with wisdom. And you can't get evil out of your life until you fill your life with good. You can't just be idle and empty. You know, mama told us, I ain't found it in the Bible, but mama was right. An idle mind is a devil's workshop. And so Jesus is making it a point here that when the enemy has gone out, don't let him find a vacancy. So in your notes, write the word no vacancy. Would you say it out loud? No vacancy. Now, in the attack of the dry place, and I want to look at Jesus here in Matthew 4, because make no mistake about it, a dry place is a place of temptation. There are three things I want you to take away from the dry place today. Number one, that is a dry place can come as a result of transgression. A dry place can be there because you're in transition. And then the third thing I want you to get from is that the dry place is a place of temptation. Now, I'll spend more time with temptation than the other two, but let me go through them real quick one more time because I don't normally give y'all numbered stuff, but uh, I'm going to do this today. N n number one, the, the dry place can come as a result of transgression. I've been in sin. Sin can lead you to a dry place. It can lead to a community being in a dry place. It can lead to a nation being in a dry place. It can lead to my life being in a dry place when I've, when I've allowed sin to separate me from God. Anybody ever allowed sin to get them in a dry place? Not something you want to say amen to in church, but you know it's true. The children of Israel in the wilderness, in their dry place, were there because of their rebellion. They were there because they kept transgressing against God. You can read the story in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 where in the New Testament, in the New Testament, God says that the children of Israel's days in the wilderness, their days in the dry place was prolonged. They stayed there longer than they needed to because of their sin against God. Now, before you say, but pastor, that's Old Testament. I just told you that's recorded in 1 Corinthians 10. That's New Testament. And verse 6 says that what Israel went through in the Old Testament should serve us as an example in the New Testament, which means when my life is out of the will of God, that can lead to a prolonged state in my dry place. But there's something else that we can learn from the children of Israel in that dry place called the wilderness where they spent 400 years. Here's something else that, that, that uh, 40 years, the, Egypt, 400 years. Th there's something else that we can learn from the dry place. And that's the second thing I gave you. The dry place for God is intended to be a transition. And this is a word I want to spend a moment on because it's, it, it, it gives hope. It gives hope because I don't know about you, but I've really been in a spiritual battle. I mean, I've been really fighting it here recently. I mean, it is just crazy what's going on in the world. And I've been attacked and this ministry has been attacked and all the unrest and the division, you know, and just, just seeing things I've experienced this week. You know, my natural mind wants to say, what's the use? You've, you've done this your whole life. You've spent your whole life trying to reconcile white and black and rich and poor and old and young and Baptists and Pentecostals and people off the street and on the street, and, and, but, but look where we are now. You, and, and, and enemy just wants to tell me, what's the use? What's the use? Give up, cave in, go somewhere else. But here's the thing. The, the dry place is not the end. I've not been destined to the dry place. That's not the place I'm going. The dry place with God and his word has always been a transition. It's a place of transition. I didn't, God has not called me to this place. He's called me through this place. This is not my destination. This is just a part of my journey. I don't plan on camping out here. I don't plan on putting my, my stakes in the ground here. I don't plan on planting big trees here. I'm not going to be here. Like my papa used to say, I don't belong here. I'm just passing through. And we've got to recognize that the dry place is just a season. It's just a transition. And we're going to come through it out to the other side. Can you say amen? For the children of Israel, the wilderness was the transition. Everybody say transition. It was the transition between Egypt 
and the promised land. Egypt is where they spent 400 years in slavery and in bondage. The wilderness was the in-between of Egypt and the land of promise. The land of promise had the fruit. The land of promise had the milk and the honey and the abundance and the clean water. The, 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 the land of promise had, had wells that they could drink of that they wouldn't have to dig. The land of promise would offer sealed houses that they could live in. It was abundant mentally, physically, spiritually, financially. Egypt was the exact opposite. But God didn't just take them from one extreme into the other. There was a transition called the wilderness. And I know many of us might have been fed up with the bondage. And we might be fed up with what's in our past and what we look back at. And we want an immediate change. But you have to know in between your bondage and your victory, in between your past and your future is a transition. And that transition is a dry place. And that dry place is where you are tested. And it's in that dry place that God said, okay, children of Israel, I got you out of Egypt, but it's going to take the dry place for me to get Egypt out of you. I got to say that again because I can't let you miss that. God was saying, okay, children of Israel, I got you out of Egypt, but it's in the dry place that I got to get Egypt out of you. Sometimes God can deliver us from a thing, but the thing is still in us. It, we may not be physically in it, but mentally it's still in us. The dry place has a way of, of heating your life up and, and, and causing you to go through a furnace where you get rid of what you don't need and you grab hold of what you do. When you're really thirsty, you don't long for a coke and a smile. You long for a fresh clean sip of water. You get rid of what you don't need and you cling to what you do. That's what the dry place will do. So it's a place of transition. So my prayer is, is that where we are as a church and where we are as a ministry and where we are as individuals and families and where we are as a nation, may this just be a transition, a transition that leads us back to, to, to our deliverer and to his will and to the hope of his promise and the hope of his word. But the enemy would love to tell us that this is it. You've reached the end of the road, but you have to tell the devil, this is not the end of the road. This is not my destiny. This is not the place that God has called me to. It might be hard. It might be dry. But you know what? The greater the trial, the greater the glory. The greater the trial, the greater the glory. And I'm going to endure this trial. And I'm going to be better for it. And stronger for it. And wiser for it. And have more faith as a result of it. I may go in it one way. But I'm coming, I'm coming out of it another way. My, my life may have not brought him glory then. But it will now. That that's got to be our hope. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying to you today? Number three, the dry place is a place of temptation. Temptation. And that's where we're going to spend the last three minutes I got with you today. I'm kidding. We got more than three. But watch this in Matthew chapter four. Then was Jesus led up of the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Why would God's spirit lead Jesus to a temptation? Because he could not get there by transgression. Sin could not bring him to this point because he was without sin. God's spirit has led Jesus to this place. And the hope I get from that is, is no matter how dry my life may be, and no matter how wicked the world may appear, and no, how much, no matter how much fear and hate and division are in this world around me, his spirit has not left me. He will never leave me. He will never forsake me. He will be with me, even under the end of the world. We all like the wonderful moments in worship and in praise when we feel the tangible touch of God, where our hair begins to stand up up on our arms and the tingling sensation comes through us and tears burst out of our eyes and we know that God is near. We love that. But you got to know that he's just as close and he's just as real and he's just as near even when you don't feel it. It's like the song goes, even when I don't feel it, he's working. Even when I can't see it, he's working. I got to know that he's with me when I see it and when I don't see it, that's when I walk by faith and not by sight. I've got to know that even in my dry place, his spirit is with me. His spirit is with me. He's not left me. He's not forsaken me. 
I'm not here alone. He's Jehovah Shammah. He's a God that is near. He's not one that is far off. He's with me. Can you say that out loud? He is with me. You have to know that today. He's not left us here. Then was Jesus led up of the spirit in the wilderness, the dry place. And look who was there, the devil, because he likes to capitalize on a dry situation. The Bible teaches that God's word, God's spirit, God's house, and Jesus are all sources of living water. I plan to show you this maybe next Sunday, but there are four sources of water in scripture, four sources, his, his, his word, his spirit, Jesus, and his house. I hope you got that. I'll, I'll deal with this, Lord willing, next week. But I got to get it out there because you'll hear me. Four sources of water based on Scripture. His Word, His Spirit, Jesus, and His house. And I'm telling you that the enemy wants to keep us away from the water. And there is a reason why we are facing what we're facing today in this environment and in this world. And don't think it wasn't strategic that the church was not allowed to gather together and in some places still can't gather and then all hell broke loose. It's because the enemy would love to have us separate and not inside the house of God and not in corporate worship and not seeing each other and loving each other and edifying one another and building up one another. Don't you know in this day right now you need to look across the room and see that there are other folk that are for you and not against you. Isn't it a glorious thing today that we got white folk and black folk and old folk and young folk and, 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 and all kind of in-between folk that are gathered together in the house of God that we don't have to buy into the narrative that we all hate each other based on something we had no control over like the color of our skin. Isn't it powerful that we can unify under the name of Jesus and know, you know what? There's something bigger than my past, bigger than my skin color, bigger than what, I, I, you know, my life would try to convey, and that is the name of Jesus and the identity that I have in him. We need to come together to remind each other who we are. If I was the enemy, I'd try to keep us away from each other too. Forgive me for that. Let me wipe my spit from my mouth for somebody to say he needs to have on a mask. Don't get me started. I'm where I'm doing, I'm doing all the natural stuff, but you better know right now, my hope is not in any natural method of a man. My hope is not in any agenda of a man. It, 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 ah, don't get me started. I ain't got time. I got 10 minutes to get all these points. I ain't got time. My hope is not in a man. My hope is not in a party. My hope is not in an organization. My hope is not in a president or a new president or another president. My hope is in Jesus. He's the Prince of Peace. He's the Savior. He's the Redeemer. He's the Deliverer. He is the only hope. My hope is not in an organization. My hope is in an organism. And the organism is the church of Jesus Christ in which he said the gates of hell would not prevail. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. So you can get mad at me and you can lie on me and post fake pictures of me saying I was here, there, or wherever. But let me be clear. My trust is in the word. My hope is in Jesus. And I will not bow to any man's narrative. I got to get back in this word. Y'all done got me fired up. Now the enemy's trying to destroy us and he knew he couldn't do it from the outside. So he's trying to do it from the inside. Because Jesus said a house divided would fall. So Satan is trying to divide. I, listen, the, na the nation been divided. I ain't worried about a nation. I'm talking about the church. The church can't let that divisive devil enter in our heart and divide us. We got to remember that it, you might be white and I, I'm hard, you might be black, but the blood of Jesus is red. And when I get to heaven, it won't matter what color I am. It will only matter that I have been redeemed. Would y'all calm down? I got one more service after this one. Oh, man. 
The enemy's trying to capitalize on, on, on this wilderness. He's trying to take advantage of us in a wilderness. He's trying to take advantage of us in a dry place. He's trying to get us to revert back to old ways. He's trying to get somebody to go back to drinking. He's trying to get somebody to turn back to the street. He's trying to get somebody to turn back to hate. He's trying to dial the clock back because there are people, white and black, that have been delivered from hate and prejudice and the enemy is putting all this stuff all around us, trying to just increase the, the wedge of distance between us. And we've got to begin to see through his tactics that he is a deceiver and he is a divider only because he is a destroyer. And we've got to recognize that the enemy has wiles. That means he has strategies and I don't trust anything he comes up with and I don't trust anything that a man comes up with. If it wasn't based on the word of God and led by the spirit of God. Whatever doesn't have Jesus on its throne, I don't bow my knee to. Whatever is not about the kingdom of God, I cannot trust its agenda. That's why my hope is in no one but the Prince of Peace, Jesus. Y'all don't need me up here preaching some platform that can't do anything. It's the kingdom that is the answer. And that's what we're going to advance here at Word of God. But where was I? <laughs> so that devil showed up. And, he, 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 and notice what he does in verse 3. And when the tempter came to him, he said, if you be the son of God. Oh, my gosh. See, 11.30 can't come in here and y'all still be here. No way to socially distant. I got to wrap this up, but this is heavy. When the tempter came to him, he said, if you be the son of God. That's a litmus test. If you be the son of God, command these stones be made bread. In other words, Satan was saying, if, if you really are the son of God, you will command these stones be made. The enemy is trying to give Jesus a litmus test to prove his identity. No matter what the enemy is up to, it's always down to identity. He's using these stones as a way to say to Jesus, you can't be the son of God. If you're one that writes in your Bibles, put Matthew 7, 9 next to that verse. Matthew 7, 9. Because in Matthew 7, 9, Jesus said, if you ask a father for bread... He will not give stone. And Jesus here has not eaten in 40 days. And Satan says, if you be the son of God, command these stones be made bread. Everything that the enemy is doing, and I got about five minutes to get this out, is about Jesus bypassing what he would have to go through to get to this end. A part of our judgment is that by sweat we would eat. Genesis 3.19. I'm sweating right now. Y'all do know that? I'm going to eat after this third service. All right? Satan is saying you don't have to sweat. Command these stones be made bread. Everything that he's saying is that you don't have to go through anything. I offer you the end without the trial. I offer you the glory without the pain. He's a liar. So Jesus is not going to get into a debate with him. He's not only going to resist the thought that the enemy planted, he's going to replace the thought with the word of God. I hope you caught that. Because that echoes what Jesus was talking about in Matthew 12 when he said when the unclean spirit is gone out, he returns when there's a vacancy. Jesus has got to deal with this thought that I have the power because I really am the son of God. 
I have the power to command these stones be made bread. He could do it. But just because he could do it didn't mean he should do it. Because God has called Jesus to, to, to reach a destiny, but he's called there to be a path, a way to that destiny. And what the enemy is saying is you don't have to go this way, that God has lined out. I'll give you a bypass, a free ticket to the end result without the trial. So Jesus responds with the word, and that's how we have to respond. Verse 4, he said, it is written... Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So now he's not just resisted the evil. He's got a word to answer it. And that's where we have to be because that's the only way according to Ephesians 6, beginning in verse 10, Ephesians 6, beginning in verse 10, that's the only way to do battle with the enemy is with the word of God. Ephesians six twelve teaches that the Bible is the sword of the spirit, which means when you don't have the word of God in your life, you've left yourself unarmed. How can you do spiritual battle and you don't have a spiritual weapon? Hosea 4, 6 says, my people are destroyed because they have no knowledge. Isaiah 5, 13, my people are going into captivity because they have no knowledge. Think of all the things that we put our hope and our trust in, but yet we don't hope and trust the word of God. Jesus said, man, don't live my bread alone. I take this off the table. I've taken this out of the equation. So the enemy said, okay, let me try something else. So he takes him up to the pinnacle of the temple. That was the very height of the temple wall that would overlook the Kidron Valley. And it is said that a fall from that, the height of that wall would have been somewhere between either 400 or 600 feet. He's up there, four to 600 feet in the air. And Satan says, jump. I, most, all my ministry life thought he was trying to get Jesus to commit suicide. It would have been suicidal. But I believe there's something bigger here because Malachi chapter 3 verse 1 says that the Messiah would make himself known in the temple. And so there was even in that day a, 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 a tradition or a, a, a thought or a, a tale that when the Messiah come, he would make his ascension on the temple. And so that was the narrative of Jesus' day. So there's something more here than him jumping off a cliff. It's about, hey, make your debut off this temple. You are the son of God. Nothing could hurt you. And then the enemy brings up Psalm 91 when he says this, for it is written, I'm in verse six, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge concerning thee and in their hands shall they bear thee up, lest at any time you dash your foot against a stone. I don't have time to get into it, but if you read Psalm 91 verse 11, verses what Satan just quoted, he omitted a statement. Isn't he good at that? Did the same thing to Eve when he said, you will not surely die, but the word was you will surely die. He's always taking scripture and tweaking it just enough to make it say something it didn't say. Why is he bringing this scripture up to Jesus? Because he recognized that's how Jesus was going to fight. So Satan said, oh, you're a word person. Let me be a scripture person too. I can give you a scripture. And you can make the Bible say anything you want to say when you take it out of its context. And the enemy specializes in taking scripture out of its context only to advance his own agenda. But here again, it's the same point. We can get you all the way to the end and we can bypass all that you're gonna have to go through because Jesus would not make his debut in the temple. Jesus would make his debut in the streets when he would heal and preach and declare the gospel and folk would be saved and made free and, and, and delivered. That's where he would make his debut. But when you read the book of Revelation, Jesus shows up in the temple of God. He is in the temple of God. What's Satan saying? Let's bypass all of this. 
this and take you straight to the place I know you're destined to be. And that's what the enemy tries to sell with you and me. There's a place you ought to be. You ought to go straight there. You shouldn't have to be dealing with anything in between. The wilderness is always a transition. But this transition is a place of temptation. And the enemy, when he offers us that end thing that he knows we were born to fulfill and that we were born to do, when he offers that end thing, it's never about that end thing. Let me show you what it's really offer, what it's really about. We're going to close. So Jesus responded with the word again, verse 7. It is written. How are we going to do battle with the enemy and we don't know the word? That's why you can't go to the, Bible, the, the, the church with your Bible and hear the pastor say, uh, 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 today we're going to read our text, and you read the text. And we'll close the Bible. We'll close your Bibles. Why, today I'll talk to you about the four Ps. I don't ever need to be in church where my Bible is closed because there ain't no preacher including James A. McMinnis got what I need outside this word. Only this word works when I go to battle. I need the word of the living God. Jeremiah 3.15, God said, I will give you pastors that will feed you with knowledge and with understanding. My responsibility is to feed you with this word so that in between Sundays, you know how to fight. In between Sundays, you know how to use the word over your marriage, over your children, over your finances, over what's ever going on in the world. You need to be Equip with the word of God because that's the only way you can do battle. But we can't do battle when we don't know the word. So Jesus responded with the word again, verse 8. Again, the devil taketh him into exceeding high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them, and said unto him, All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Satan's agenda is always the same, to turn worship from God. That's why he got put out of heaven. He convinced a third of the angels, worship me. I'm your answer. I'm your way. And you read the Old Testament and you see all the idols that exist. You think about this world and how many man-made gods there are. Pastor Brian, I know India is probably the, 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 has the most. How many idols are in India? 33 million. 33 million different gods in India. Can you imagine that? The enemy does not matter which little G God you worship. As long as you don't worship the capital G God, the creator of heaven and earth. And this is always his end result. To divert my worship, to divert my glory from the throne room, from the king of kings and from the Lord of lords, to divert it to some idol. Church, listen to me. We've got to make a decision. I will worship no one but Jesus. I will put no one or nothing before Jesus. He is my savior. He is my deliverer. He is my redeemer. He is my way maker. He is my healer. He is my provider. He is my protector. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the truth. And Jesus is the life. And no matter how hard things may get, I will not take my worship away from the one that gave his life for me. Can you say amen? Now, let me, let me read this and I got to close. I'm five minutes over. Once Jesus made the stand, In verse 10, and said, get thee hence Satan. It is written, third time he used scripture. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. He said that in a dry place. Watch what what happened in verse 11. Read with me. Then the devil leaveth him. You can stop right there. Then the devil leaveth him. You want to get the devil to leave your life, leave your marriage, leave your home? Put the word of God on him. Make a decision that no matter what this world throws at me, no matter how dry the atmosphere may be, and I'm preaching this series on dry places, and all of a sudden a Sahara storm, dust covers Shreveport for two or three days. I said, man, I can't even see the sun. How in the world sand make it all the way from the Sahara? The atmosphere done got dry. I know there's got to be something to this. But you know what? 
It don't matter what's going on in this world. We got to be like Jesus and say, you know what? Uh -uh. I'll only worship God when it's good, when it's bad, when it's easy, when it's hard. I'll only worship God when my, when my table's loaded and, and when I don't have nothing but a can of beans. I'm going to worship Jesus when I got 50 friends. I'm going to worship Jesus when 40 of them turn against me. Come on, somebody. Let me pray for you this morning. Glory to God. Father, we thank you for your word and that your word never returns to you void. Father, I pray right now in this moment that, Lord, you would show us where we are in this dry place, that you would show us how to respond to the dry place that we're living in, that we find ourselves in right now. What's your dry place right now? How are you responding to it? How are you letting it shape you? Church, I just want to encourage you today. The greater the trial, the greater the glory. Don't let fear overcome you. Don't let anxiety distract you. He's not left us. He's not going to leave us. He always gets the last word. Even what the enemy meant for evil. God will specialize in turning it for good. Even when you don't understand it and you can't see it, he's able to do it. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, I believe Jesus died for me and that you love me. And by your grace, my sins are forgiven and I'm saved. I believe Jesus is the only hope So I make a decision to fill my life with your word and your ways. And I pray that in the dry place, my worship would never change. Thank you for giving me the power to walk past my transgressions by the power of your blood to make it through this transition to the destiny you have for my life and giving me the ability to endure the temptation. In Jesus' name, amen.